But, you know, we've been talking about, you know, biology versus psychology, and I I would like us just Mm -hmm. to make sure that we add to that picture social factors, Mm because I really believe that social factors cause more sexual problems than either psychological or biological ones. Social factors like what? Social factors like changing expectations, for example. I think changing expectations and the escalation of expectations to the point, uh, you know, where it's very easy to fail, quote unquote. If you have to have an orgasm every single time you have sexual relations, it's going to be hard to accomplish that because we're all supposed to be robots and it's all supposed to be biological and automatic. Mm -hmm. Uh, These expectations are part of the culture now. So I feel like social factors, let's put in there the lack of, of sex education, the lack of comfort in talking about sex, the fact that it's still embarrassing for a lot of people to talk about it, that they lack a diverse vocabulary for expressing how they feel, what they want. Uh, That's a lot of what we do in sex therapy. I'll say, you know, people come in, they're practically tongue-tied. I saw a guy the other night. Um, He he must have said, I never thought of it 150 times. (laughs) I would say, how did you feel about that? Why did you want that? Why did you say that to her? You know, why... How often do you want to have sex? Well, I'd like to have sex every day. Why? Long pause. What do you mean, why? I never thought of it. Mm-hmm. It would be that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Say, well, you know, think about it now. Why? Well, everybody wants to, don't they? Well, maybe everybody does, but tell me why you do. Long pause. I never thought about it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's so many ways in which people lack uh, comfort in the topic and lack of vocabulary for dealing with the topic, and I see that as a social problem. Right. Now, you are today, of course, you're a a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the New York University School of Medicine. You lecture widely about sexuality all over the world. You have a private psychotherapy practice. But when you went off to Berkeley in the 1960s, you studied a very different aspect of reproduction. Well, I, I went to Berkeley as a as a junior in college. I spent my first two years here in New York, and then I went to Berkeley. So I started working with rodent sexuality because I was under the impression, as were we all in the field, mm-hmm. that there was this kind of big mammalian thing about sexuality. In mammals, we were all kind of variations on a theme. And that if you could see how the mechanisms worked in the rat, how the hormones affected the uh, learning environment, affected the testing environment, um, sort of the psychobiology of the rat would tell you something about the psychobiology of the dog, of the monkey, of the camel, of the shark, of whatever, Mm -hmm. and of the human being. And it, we were all just one big, happy mammalian family. And, and so I, I kind of thought, well, that's interesting. And watching animals mate, that was mildly interesting. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit goes a long way. But still, you know, there are things to, to learn. So I did that at Berkeley and did my dissertation and went off to have a career. Now, you got a Ph.D. in the hormones and mating habits of the golden Hamst- hamster. Right. Mesocrisitis auratus, the golden hamster. Is this something now, when you look back, you understand why you went this route? Or is it something you kind of think, oh, well, I I wouldn't have done that now? I wouldn't have done that now, underscore, underscore. (laughs) I mean, to me, the, the world changed, you know, in the 1970s with the women's movement. My head completely changed. Uh, this happened to so many of us, but uh, you know, each story is is the story of a profound reconsideration of your whole life and of everything that you used to think and believe. On ideas, you're listening to sexologist and psychologist Leonor Tiefer talk about her favorite subject, sex. After a PhD in biological constructs of sex. Leonor Tiefer's intellectual world was turned upside down when she discovered feminism while teaching at Colorado State University. Leonor Tiefer, 
in conversation with Mary O'Connell. So, you know, we're cooking along, 1970, 71, and then another woman joins the department. And this is, this is the event I look back on, Pamela Pearson. She came from Chicago, and she was a lesbian. And uh, I didn't know any lesbians, so she was a lesbian, so she had a girlfriend, so that was really interesting. And she said, do you know about the movement and I said, uh, the movement. <laughs> what what movement? Uh, and she said, you know, the women's movement. There's speeches, there's marches, there's pamphlets, mm. there's a revolution going on there, the women's liberation movement, WLM. Mm. And I thought, oh, my God, gimme, gimme, gimme. So I started reading and reading and reading and reading, and I, oh, my God, that's me. Sexuality was a big topic back then. Uh, you are in charge of your body. You should know about your body. Get a speculum. Look at your cervix. I got involved in a consciousness raising group, and we got some of these plastic speculums, and we looked at our cervixes. <laughs> then there were these papers like um, Anne Cote, K-O-E-D-T, you remember her? No. The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm? Yes, of course. Right, that was a stunning paper. It was very energizing. There was a lot of work to do, and there was a lot being written about sex. Now, Betty Dobson? Dodson, the, the, Dodson. yes. Dodson, mm. she was uh, a big name then. She's here in New York. She's in her late 70s and still absolutely a ball of fire. Uh, she had been a graphic artist. And in 1974, she published a pamphlet of her genital drawings. She'd been a graphic artist. She kind of became an erotic artist, drew a lot of nudes, and then got this idea to draw women's genitalia partly for um, artistic purposes because she thought women's genitalia was beautiful, like flowers, you know, an infinite variety, no two the same. And so let me draw them. So she wrote this booklet, and it was called Liberating Masturbation. And it was full of these drawings, and it was the story of how she learned to call it a meditation on self-love. And she started doing um, group workshops here in in New York, and uh, they, this pamphlet kind of described how women could learn about their bodies and their capacities for pleasure mm -hmm. through masturbation. That was totally, totally revolutionary. I mean, it doesn't seem like that would happen today, or it just seems almost improbable. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a brief thing um, maybe in the middle 90s, you know, if AIDS sort of was discovered in 1981 or two or so, and people started really getting acquainted with the methods of transmission and so on in the late 80s, there were so many interesting things that happened in sexuality. And one of them was was called sexual healing. There was a whole trend mm -hmm. of sexual healing that was about outer course, a term you have probably never heard of. Mm -hmm. This term never took off. But the idea was that if AIDS was transmitted by the bodily fluids and penetration, if we could find activities that were safe mm -hmm. but highly erotic, intensely pleasurable, that we could teach people these things and kind of shift the uh, focus of sexual activity from penetration to outer course, mm -hmm. both for men with men, women with women, men with women, everybody. And it would be much safer. And so outer course, of course, involved a lot of manual stimulation and group learning. So these sexual healing workshops did, in fact, involve group masturbation, but that came and went. I mean, what would you, how would you describe how that has happened, that outer course didn't sort of take off, so to speak? Well, I guess it's the same reason that I think Viagra did take off, that the culture, despite the tremendous uh, 
commercial explosions of sexuality uh, is not really a sensual, pleasure-oriented sexual culture. And it was ahead of its time. <laughs> Outer course is ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. That that whole rhetoric of penetrative sex being real sex uh, was still completely dominant and there simply wasn't enough time and there wasn't the educational infrastructure. I mean, you never saw an article in the New York Times about outer course, Mm -hmm. but you see endless articles in the New York Times about erectile dysfunction and fixing it with this, that, or the other drug. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Is somehow outer course... I think, is is seen as a, just a little bit dirty. You know, it's a little bit prurient. It's a little bit too lubricious, whereas medicalized sex and functions of the body and this and that, as if the functions of sex were built in. They're not built in. Mm-hmm. Sex is anything you want it to be. It could be out of course. It could be inner course. But perhaps maybe what is, is something needed, you think, that there should be declared a penetration-free week <laughs> per year where it is suggested strongly that they indulge in outer course. You'll have to have an extremely macho male politician uh, promote outer course week. Well, we have a lot of those. That'll be good because otherwise it'll be seen as a anti-male, man-hating you know, that's how a lot of things got delegitimized uh, from the feminist point of view. We had all these great ideas, you know, let's have uh, much more foreplay, you know, let's have less intercourse, let's have more tenderness and touching and manual stimulation and not so much intercourse and, oh yeah, man-hating, man-hating. You know, it's it's all the same story. It's about the weird way that sex is dealt with in this culture. I mean, I'm an intellectual. That's why you've invited me to talk on ideas, right? I ought to be in academia. Mm -hmm. But there are no departments of sexology or sexuality studies in academia. The the academic study of sexuality is, uh, is embryonic. So after I decided that I couldn't do animal research anymore Mm -hmm. because I just didn't believe in the model, uh, I still thought of myself as a sexologist. uh, And I looked around, what were my options? Well, it seemed like the, the main option, either I could be like a high school sex educator, something mm-hmm. like that, which that in and of itself is there's not too many jobs there, but at least there are some. Or maybe I could go into clinical work. And that appealed to me, you know, listening to people's stories and trying to be helpful. That, that seems like a good idea. So I re-specialized as a clinician. I got another degree. And then where am I going to get a job. Well, I got an opportunity to work in this urology department by word of mouth. Um, Now, you worked um, in the Center for Male Sexual Dysfunction in the Department of Urology at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City. Actually, yes. I worked in two two urology departments, Beth Israel and Montefiore Mm -hmm. Medical Center. So a combined 13 years, yeah. Now, we would never witnessed on the social landscape, though, these kinds of male sexual dysfunction clinics before run by urologists. Why? Um, there were a few urologists who began to see that this might be a legitimate subspecialty, and they began opening these centers for male, male sexuality. Mm-hmm. And um, they began having urological meetings and you know after years later i went back and thought to myself why why did they start then mm-hmm. and i discovered that two of the main ways that urologists had been making money had disappeared because of a uh, technological progress you know one of them was kidney stone surgery, Mm -hmm. and there was the invention of this lithotripsy machine that used shock waves to break up Mm. kidney stones so you didn't need to do surgery anymore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, almost overnight, 
uh, kidney stone surgery became uh, much, much less prevalent. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was non-cancerous surgery of the prostate. Mm -hmm. Well, they used to do surgery for that. My father had that surgery in 1977. I remember that very well. Mm -hmm. But uh, drugs were invented in the 1980s to shrink the prostate, so you didn't need to have surgery for a benign condition anymore. So urologists had kind of the rug pulled out from under them. Mm. This is how I understood it then in retrospect, and, and they began looking around. What else could they do? It's very interesting you're saying this kind of confluence of events. Did the feminist movement itself have anything to do with these centers for male sexual dysfunction popping up, so to speak? I I don't think so. Because you know that's part of the rap. In a sense, people say, well, you know, uh, men started feeling much more insecure. Oh, I see what and, you're saying. And, uh, you know, the reasons were women were saying, you know, I can make rules or demands of my own body. I don't have to just go along, right, sexually. You know, it's, it sounds good, and I might be tempted to go along with that, except that the men that I saw in the Beth Israel urology department and the men that I then saw at Montefiore when I moved to that other hospital were not the least bit influenced by this type of rhetoric and their wives or girlfriends were not the feminist kind of people either. Mm -hmm. So while I do agree with you that the, uh, that the rules changed, I, I think you're right about there being a kind of atmosphere, but I wouldn't say it's of the women's movement. I think it's more of kind of capitalism looking for more and more markets, mm -hmm. you know, seeing everything as an opportunity for commercialization. You know, why are there so many urologists in the first place? You know, this is a, a larger question. Why aren't there more geriatricians? You know, that has to do with economic issues uh, as much as gender issues or sexuality issues. Right. So when you you say once you create a center like this, the Male Center for Sexual Dysfunction, even if men do not attend this center, there is an atmosphere created. Absolutely. There are messages given, perhaps, that, oh, you know, that perhaps there's stress, anxiety that's created? I totally think that that's what happened, that the uh, there was a lot of news uh, about these centers. There was a, a lot of coverage of the new medical view of erections, uh, endless stories about, oh, if only we had a drug. Wake up here. What's the matter with you? Uh, you may have a problem. Your partner may have a problem. And you might say, well, that's that's a good message because here are these suffering people who never had any encouragement. But I see the other side, which is that we're creating anxiety in people who were just getting along okay or who were having outer course mm -hmm. or other kinds of, of uh, cuddling and uh, intimacy, pleasure, um, and were not troubled about it. But now... It is absolutely essential to one's self-esteem as an individual and to the couple's self-esteem. You know, we're not a real relationship. We're not having sex, people say nowadays. That didn't used to be true. 